to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Let your light shine so that men may see your good works. We are to be the light in a dark world. It says we will not all sleep, but we all be changed. And that word change means to alter, transform, or revolutionize. Welcome to session three, and we're going to be tackling two chapters in the book and two chapters in the workbook. Both chapter three and four are going to be covered in this session called Heroes and Battlegrounds. And we're going to define the word heroes. What does it mean to be a hero? Does that mean you have superpowers? Does that mean everybody knows you because you're famous? No, actually a lot of heroes nobody knows, and a lot of people are heroes unaware. So I'm going to give you the definition. Yes, superwoman, number one, she's known, but it also is champion conquer, protagonist, leader. Anybody that's a leader has the potential to be a hero. And then the last one, a brave woman. You can be a hero by just being a brave woman. And that's going to look different in everybody's life. Perhaps you're thinking, that's really good news because I just found out I'm a target and I have never seen myself as a hero. I'm feeling like the Sarah Connor who has done nothing. Well, it doesn't matter if you haven't done anything up until this point in this moment that can change. And I want to talk to you just about how quickly that shift can happen. God is going to just look for you to give him permission. I want to read to you a quote, one of my favorite quotes by A.W. Tozier. He said, we, that's you and me, everybody under the sound of my voice, no matter what your age, we can be in our day, in the 21st century, in our day, what the heroes of faith were in their day. But remember, at the time, they didn't know they were heroes. They didn't have the legacy of Hebrews 11 and go, whoa, look at me, I'm amazing, I'm hero. No, they didn't find out they were heroes till later. And a lot of us are like them. We are heroes unaware and that's okay, but let's add some intent to this and let's find out what is common ground for all heroes. Number one, let's go to our father of faith, Mr. Abraham. How did he become a hero? Well, I love this. Romans 4 and 17 in the message said, we call Abraham father, which means he's going to be setting a DNA pattern for, he, he's going to be setting some examples for us, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint. Yeah, I don't think he did that. But because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Number one thing God is looking for is your permission to make a somebody and a something out of a nothing and a nobody. That's how it starts. When you just say, God, you know, I have nothing to bring you. I have no good background. I have barely any knowledge of the scripture, but I'm going to give you my nothing completely. I know that that is how I started. And I didn't start out a hero, but I started on the path to being a hero. I remember I was like, God, I don't even know one single scripture, but if you can do something with me, who is a nobody, who knows nothing, then you can have my everything. Give God permission right now, right now. Let's just say, God, you know what? You have permission. You can have my nothing. You can have my nobody. Make me a somebody. Let me do something to bring you glory. How hard is that? It's, it's, it's actually pretty easy. Hero begins in the unseen realm of faith. Just speaking it, just saying it is how we begin the journey. And faith is this unseen, powerful force that give God substance to be able to begin and do things in our lives. Hebrews 11 verses 1 through 2 says, 
the fundamental, that means foundational, the fundamental fact of existence, all of our existence, is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It is our handle. It's how we grip a hold of something. Faith would be the handle of the sword. It is our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors and set them above the crowd. When you act, when you cannot see, that is faith. And now we're not just being stupid and jumping off of things, but there is a substance, there is a quickening. When God says, go and talk to that person or go give this or do that. And you say, well, I don't see any reason in the natural for me to do that person doesn't even look like they want me to talk to them. When you step out, and you do something that you can't see, then you begin to see God get involved. You give him substance and he gives you action. Action, heroes step out in faith. And there is a huge list that we have in the book that talks about the by faith. And again, by faith means doing what doesn't seem to make sense. By faith, Abraham left everything he knew and began to look for some place he actually never found. He said, by faith, Abraham left and he walked and he lived as a soldier looking, looking for a kingdom and a city whose builder and maker was God. People by faith are always looking for something they have yet to see. But by faith, some of the saints skipped death, pleased God, built a massive ark in the middle of the desert. Hello, there was no water, it was dry land. And it said that when Noah built the ark, he drew a line in the sand and he drew a line between righteousness and unrighteousness. And it said actually his act of building the ark condemned the world. Traveled to places unknown, lived as strangers in the land. Hey, you know what? It takes faith to live as a stranger in this land. You're gonna feel uncomfortable. When you live as a stranger, not just act strange in this land, when you live as a stranger, when you say this place doesn't have a hold on me, people aren't gonna understand that. Kept their eyes on the eternal, receive what God did for them by faith. And so much of that, we have to receive by faith. I mean, sometimes, you know, I just feel like, hey, God, I wouldn't forgive me. I like, I'm really being naughty right now. I think you should maybe hold off for about a week and then maybe forgive me when I've done enough penance. But you know what? God has already forgiven me even before I pray. I don't realize I'm forgiven until I pray. That's why repentance is important. But we just receive it by faith, not by how I feel about it, not why it looks like, not by how other people are treating me. If God says I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. It doesn't matter. Goes on to say, became pregnant in old age and birthed a nation. Hello, I still think Sarah is like the bomb. I mean, I'm like, okay, so what? Abraham got women pregnant. This woman got pregnant, carried it full term, never miscarried. How awesome is that? She received a promise when everything was impossible. Prophesied destiny to their children in the book of Exodus. I love that Joseph was all about, you know what, people, this is what's gonna happen. Right now, I know it doesn't look like this, but we're, you're gonna leave one day. And when you leave, you need to take my bones. You need to take them with it because we're here now, but we will not always be here. People by faith understand that what is is always giving way to what is yet unseen. And so people that live by faith speak the unseen, not copy and echo the seen. Again, it goes back to who is gonna, who are we gonna let forge our prayers and who are we gonna let forge our prayers? words. Celebrated the prophet, braved the king's decree and hid those children, didn't kill them. Toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took promises for themselves. You know, I, I have to be honest with you. I get so many people and I, I love people saying, I need you to keep me in prayer. And I just say, no, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be praying for you. And they're like, what? I'm like, I, if I carried everybody in my brain that has asked me to carry them in prayer, I will I will not have any other room in my brain. And I, I'm, I'm older now and I don't have this capacity to remember who you are. And so the Bible says that we don't have to go to somebody else and say, please keep me in your prayers. Mm -hmm. that, that God's promises come true. It says, by faith, mm -hmm. you take the promises for yourself. You don't want to be dependent on me remembering. You're going to get nothing. I'll forget. You need to take the promises of God for yourself. Well, my husband doesn't pray with me. My husband doesn't pray with me. You take the promises of God for yourself. Come on, women, let's grow up. Won battles, turned disadvantage 
to advantage, routed enemies, received their loved ones back from the dead. Hello, that was the women that did those. So here's this massive list. And I could go on and on. And, you know, I really challenge you to look at every single one of those because I didn't read all of them. But I want to highlight four things I believe you can start right now. And these four things is, number one, I already mentioned it, receive. Receive what God has already done for you by faith and then continue to walk it out. It's not a one-time thing like, oh yeah, you know, Abraham, he received it by faith and he didn't say, I got it by faith. I'm going back to Ur. He didn't do that. He continued, consistently looked, walked, declared, and lived as an alien in the land. It is not a one-time thing. We walk out the promises of God. We take them by faith and then we walk them out in substance. He consistently lived by faith. The just, if you're justified, the just shall live by faith. You say, I'm living by grace. The just shall live by faith. Grace empowers you to live by faith. Faith without works is dead. We are people who take what God is and we receive it. Then we understand because we've received it, we're graced to live it. We live out what God has already appropriated to us by faith. And when we have that kind of attitude, when we say, you know, God, I don't see it, but you see it. So it doesn't matter what I see. I don't say it, but you're saying it. So now I'm going to start to say what you say about me. God, I, I'm not acting this way, but because you're saying that this is my destiny, I'm going to begin to act like somebody going in that direction. When you begin to say, it says, you actually please God. You actually please God. God is up there looking at you and going, smiling. I think he's like, whoa, you see that girls with swords group? Did you just hear him say, whoa, here's my nobody. Make me a somebody. I'm going to receive it by faith. He's like, I like them. He's like smiling on you. His favor is on you. When you begin to walk in faith, there is like a force field. There is like a favor on you. There is like the, the, the light of God on you. He's like, let's all make everything come together so that this can happen for them. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. And most people don't have any problem with that. And that he rewards those who seek them. Well, so-and-so drew near and they didn't get anything. It doesn't matter. We do not compare what happens to other people. We take hold of the promises of God. I love how Job had the attitude of, you know what? Uh, none of this looks right. Yet though he slay me, I'll praise him. Yet no matter what I go through, God is still good. Yet no matter what I see, God is faithful. We declare who he is, not what we see. We declare the unseen, not the seen. We declare the eternal, not the temporal that is giving way, yielding to what is eternal. It says living by faith pleases God in addition to faith being assurance of things hoped for. You know, like you just, sometimes like nothing has changed, but there is an assurance that it is taken care of. And if somebody says, how do you know that? I, I just... I just have an assurance. There is something inside of me. I have a quickening. I just believe this is taken care of. Well, nothing's changed. It's actually gotten worse. You know what? It's, it's done. It's taken care of. Yeah. I have received it. It is done. Well, don't you think you should pray harder about it? Actually, I feel like praying about harder now. That might be an insult. I think right now, I just need to thank God and say, God, I thank you. You've got this completely taken care of. You know, when my children ask me for something and I say, I got you covered. And then they start getting on their knees. Oh God, please, my mom, please possibly help me with this. I'm like, whoa, whoa, you're saying I'm a bad mom. Come on, God is a good God. He is a good God. He loves it when we say, thank you, dad, you got that covered. I don't even have to care about that anymore. I'm going to do what you want me to do. Receive it. We need to understand that faith is confidence, trust, devotion, constancy. I can't even tell you how many battles in life you will win just by outlasting your enemies, just stay consistent. Loyalty, completely confident in allegiance to our king. So the opposite of living by faith would be living a life of disloyalty. Afraid of what's gonna happen, so you're always gonna sell out your friends. Make sure nobody else looks good because it might make you look bad. Disloyalty, disbelief. I wish I could believe, but you know, I'm measuring it by what happened last time when, when I tried to believe and it just didn't happen. No, you don't do that. Choose the route of pleasing 
God. Blessings, not cursings. Life, not death. Because when you choose that route, it's no longer just about you. You begin to bless your descendants. I love the fact that God entrusts us with legacy. He gives us far sight. He says, when you live like this, it's not just you that's going to get blessed, but your children and your children's children will be blessed. Intentional choice. I love what it says in Psalm 105, 7 through 9. It says, he promises. He is Jehovah, our God. His judgments are all in the earth, meaning all over the earth. These promises, they're like, they're waiting for you. You don't have to like go to Israel to access them. They're all over the earth. Well, may I need to go to intercessor all night. I mean, it's actually the promises are all over the earth. Wherever you are, the word of faith is in your mouth. You do not have to go somewhere, wherever you are. They're all over the earth. He hath remembered his covenant. You don't even have to remember it. He has remembered his covenant forever. The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, the oath with Isaac. We have a chance to walk in the original covenant that God made before there was even a law. The covenant of Abraham, the covenant of blessing, the covenant of I am your all in all, your all sufficient one. Then it goes on. If we're going to do all these things, then we actually are going to have to choose, choose to live as a stranger in this land which means we live in such a way that we understand we are passing through. We are passing through. Heroes are always brave, but don't imagine that always brave means never afraid. Always brave does not equal never afraid. It just means they choose to have a brave response even when they are afraid. One of my favorite quotes that captures this is by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he said, a hero is no braver than an ordinary man, but he is braver five minutes longer. Sometimes it just takes five minutes longer, five minutes longer before you say something, five minutes longer before you cave or run, five minutes longer. That five minutes can make the difference between cowardice and bravery. Five minutes, you can do anything for five minutes, come on. We can be brave five minutes longer. Heroes have something more to them. Joseph Campbell said, a hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. Heroes champion causes rather than champion themselves. They're all talking about what we can do together, not what they have done on their own. Chances are you know heroes, mothers, teachers, friends, pastors, people that make people be the best they were created to be. Those are heroes. You can be that person in somebody's life without even knowing it. Heroes, because they champion something greater than them, they will dare to be more daring. They will dare to be more compassionate. They will dare to take more risk because they've got it that God is going to back them because it isn't their idea. They are enforcing a God idea. There is always something more that meets the eyes and heroes understand that. Paul said in the book of Ephesus to the church of Ephesus, and I'm going to read six through 10. I am going to do the message here because I want it to be very practical. God is strong and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set up for you, well made weapons of the best materials and put them to use. So you will be able to stand up to everything. You don't test swords in a battlefield. You practice them. You have seasons of training. Everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we will walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps a life and death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You are up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it is all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. 
in this ongo in the same way prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare pray hard long pray for your brothers and sisters keep your eyes open keep each other's spirit up so that no one falls behind or drops out i would say this is the mandate of this book god is strong and he wants you strong there are indispensable weapons that he has already made stop picking and choosing learn how to use all of them not just faith not just love not just mercy not just righteousness not just all of them they're life apps they're not concepts they're life apps which brings me to my next section where we're actually going to be shorter on because i feel like we covered it really well in the book the battleground you say okay i'm ready to sign up where's this battle well i want to reach you where this battle is the book of ephesians 6:12 describes it for we all of us not just the guys not just the girls we all of us corporately do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places you may say okay i seriously don't want to be in a wrestling match well you actually are whether you knew it or not so you're either going to wrestle with your mind and wrestle with people who are not your enemies or you can wrestle with what is behind all of the attacks and go to the very core and the root of what the battle is about you say you don't know how people seem like they've targeted me yeah you're you're definitely a target but you need to understand your shadow boxing if you think that you wrestle with people you have to go to the force of what is behind that just as surely as labor proceeds all of our natural births i believe there is a battle before there is a dream and jesus had a dream he had a dream that he would have a church that would actually express his glory in such a stunning way that the whole world would know that he was loved and that they were loved but i'm also learning from reading his words again on the last supper night that some of Jesus' prayers still wait to be answered john 17 20 23 he says i don't ask for these only meaning the disciples around the table jockeying for position with two swords but also for those who will believe in me through their word we believe because of their word who believes because of you that they may all be one just as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me the glory that you have given me i have given to them that they might be one even as we are one i in them and you in me that they might become perfectly one so that the world might know that you sent me and love them even as you love me the battle is for us to become one we all know that houses that are divided fall we fight to become one you know john and i are always um stunned when we hear about marriages where people are getting divorced and you're like they never even fought and john and i are like man we like fight once a week like these people said oh we finally had one fight our whole 5 45 years of marriage and then they get divorced you know sometimes we have to fight for our marriages and sometimes you fight in a relationship because you're fighting for a relationship So it all has to be about a motive. But the enemy fights so that we are not one. We need to be people who fight for oneness. Matthew 5:19 says, "God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God." And I understand that peace does not equal compromise, but sometimes peace comes when we confront Sometimes peace comes when we have to let our pride go down and decide what is really truly important in this equation. Division never glorifies Jesus. Discord divides hearts, homes, voices, allegiances that God wants to be aligned on this earth because of discourse are divided, kingdoms 
Division has many faces, but I'm going to read them to you. Pride, contention, slander, gossip, idolatry, bitterness, witchcraft, offense. A lot of people are like, yeah, those witches, you know, I'm sorry, that's just one in a many faceted list. James 3.14 says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. And why am I even talking about this? Because when there is a hero generation rising, we have to be careful that we don't become competitors and then have selfish ambition and have vain glory and have jealousy and envy because then we will not be heroes, we'll be dividers and we'll end up being instrument in Satan's hand. We have got to be a people who are unified. C.S. Lewis said there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and then counterclaimed by Satan. You need to weigh every moment, every word, every inch of your life that you claim it for God and then you stand on it. So I wanted to tell you right now a scripture that I feel like captures all of this is found in Isaiah 27. It says at that time, and it's talking about our time period, God will unsheath his sword, his merciless, massive, mighty sword. He'll punish the servant Leviathan as he flees, the serpent Leviathan thrashing in flight. He'll kill that very old dragon that lives in the sea. So while God is battling on our behalf, this is what we do. At the same time, a fine vineyard will appear. There's something to sing about. I, God, tend it. I keep it well watered. I keep careful watch over it so that no one can damage it. As our God on high fights, we flourish. As we flourish and are well tended, he fights. He is the one that's going to strike this killing blow. We need to just flourish in everything that he has entrusted us, faith, hope, and love. I want to close with this lovely one. You are powerful. <music>